this is our eighth week. This is our final week. Uh, we've been working hard at this, and uh, and uh, congratulations to everyone for for getting through all this material and and uh, wading through this this really substantial material. We have two uh, special guests today. Uh, uh, Ariel uh, uh, Tekwe Deranger and Leah Gazan are here today. Steve's going to introduce them a little later, but thank you very much. We are honored to have you both here, even though uh, Leah is the official honorable uh, Leah Gazan as a, as a member of parliament. We honor you both. Uh, and and uh, Leah and Ariel, you should know that this is a circle of incredibly dedicated people. Uh, it's been a very ambitious study group. We've, we've read the, the book of uh, Seth Klein. We've also, uh, we, we've also been looking at policy papers, articles, listen to podcasts, uh, watch YouTube videos. Uh, it, it, it's been a busy eight to nine weeks for sure. So this week we read, uh, for, uh, read the report from Indigenous Climate Action uh, called Decolonizing Climate Policy in Canada. And we also uh, listened to an interview where Ariel uh, talked about her experience at COP26 and, and how uh, it could have afforded to have a, a, a greater, uh, it could have uh, heard a lot more of the Indigenous voice at, at, that, at that meeting uh, as an understatement. Um, and we also listened to uh, the Indigenous Climate Action podcast, which was about two uh, Indigenous activists, Melina Labucan Massimo and Dallas Goldtooth. We heard, we heard a bit of their story and how they've been on the front line of activism, both, both, uh, both out in the field and also uh, uh, working with uh, divestment, working with the banks. So to get started, the, uh, the uh, Indigenous Climate Action uh, uh, report uh, re referenced the uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People quite a bit, specifically, uh, most specifically, three articles, number 3, 18, and 19. And, um, and you heard a bit from this, um, this book last, last uh, week. I think that provided our closing prayer last week. Uh, but I'll read from it again, because what it is, it is a, uh, it is a reading of UNDRIP, but also with a poetic response to it from, uh, of, from both a settler voice and an indigenous voice. Uh, we, we, Lila June Johnson responds to each article, uh, who she's, she's uh, of uh, Diné and Cheyenne and a uh, European heritage. And then, and then Joy DeVito also responds in with po her poetry too. She's a settler, uh, a Canadian settler coming out of Ontario. So I'm gonna read from article 19 of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and then we'll hear two, two responses. Article 19. States shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the Indigenous peoples concerned uh, through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free, prior, and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. Lila June Johnson says, the oldest woman, the mother of all, she birthed the next generation with sweat building on her brow hanging on to the belt hanging from the roof, the belt her mother gave her at 13 winters. Squatting, never laying on her back, she birthed the next generation in the context of ceremony and song. If you wish to consult with our representative institution, then go to her. She will help you understand what the next generation will need. Joy DeVito response, confess it. Free prior and informed consent disarms powers and shatters structures. It acknowledges hosts and the etiquette of guests. It assumes equality in discussion, 
the right to information, the right to say no. The colonizer's yes has always been the answer to the questions never asked. Steve, I turn it to you. Thank you so much, Ian. Thanks, Ian. Uh, just so appreciate that reading and those prayers. Good evening, friends. It's great to be with you all. Wonderful to have this opportunity to engage Ariel Deranger and Leah Gazan in conversation. Allow me to introduce, I'm going to welcome Leah and uh, Ariel into this room as well, so you can all see them. Awesome. So glad to have these two amazing women with us tonight. Ariel Durange is a member of the Athabasca Chippewyan First Nation and a mother of two children. And she comes from a family of Indigenous rights advocates who have fought for the sovereignty and autonomy of their Indigenous territories in what is now known as Treaty 8 Canada. Since 2017, Ariel has served as the Executive Director of Indigenous Climate Action, an organization that's guided by Indigenous knowledge keepers and land defenders from across the country. Ariel and ICA work on connecting and supporting Indigenous communities in order to reinforce their place as leaders who are driving climate change solutions. Now, if you'd like to know more about Ariel and her work, I encourage you to check out the Indigenous Climate Action website, and I'll put a link in just a moment into the chat so you can check that out. Well, Leah Gazan is a member of Wood Mountain Lakota Nation located in Treaty 4 territory, but she lives in Treaty 1 in the most beautiful city, our shared hometown of Winnipeg. A longtime educator and activist, Leah is currently the Member of Parliament for Winnipeg Centre and serves as the NDP's critic for children and families, as well as a critic for women and gender equality and the deputy critic for housing. In 2020, Leah introduced legislation, the Climate Emergency Action Framework that called on Canada to respect its international commitments under the UN Convention on Climate and to do so while fully complying with that Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Over the past few years, Leah's worked closely with anti-poverty coalitions, Indigenous peoples, unions, and more to create a national framework for a guaranteed livable basic income. And she recently tabled legislation to that effect. And you can learn more about Leah uh, at her website, which I encourage you to check out, and it's leahgazan.ca. So Ariel, Leah, on behalf of the circle, thank you both so much for being here and for taking time. We know that you're so busy doing good work to make a better world. And we look forward to this conversation and pray that you come away encouraged. Ian? So we're going to open it up for questions. Uh, well, not open it up. Steve and I have, we, well, you have provided us with a, a great number of questions. And uh, too too many for us to 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 tackle in this in this short hour. Uh, so what we did uh, is we we looked at all the questions that we put them in a big pot and we saw what bubbled up, what were sort of sort of the common threads, what were the things that seemed to be most readily on our hearts, and and uh, I hope and pray that uh, as we ask these questions uh, that uh, you hear the questions that you've been asking. Um, so I think, Steve, you're going to start off with the first question. Yeah, and this first one is for Ariel. So uh, Ariel, as Ian mentioned, this last week, members of our learning circle read this uh, almost 60-page report from ICA, Decolonizing Climate Policy in Canada. And in it, we learned that despite the federal government's promise to honour a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, Indigenous peoples are being treated as stakeholders and not as self-determining peoples when it comes to taking action on climate. So we're wondering, can you say more about that and share what a nation-to-nation -nation decision-making process might look like and why that's not only vital to Indigenous peoples, but to the planet and to us all? But just starting with a little question. 
They'll start small. They'll, they'll start small here. They'll get bigger as we go on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so first off, Eklanete, Dennis Otlane Tairs, Ekwe Huche, Jarage Betsini Hasli. I just wanted to introduce myself in my language. Uh, I come from the Durage family. Our traditional last name was uh, Deskelne, which meant riverkeeper in Dene Um, And I currently reside in the Muskuchi uh, which also known as Edmonton and Treaty 6 territory. So I'm a visitor, although our people also came here quite a bit because Edmonton was kind of a gathering place of many nations, just to situate myself uh, and in a place um, and give honor and recognition to the peoples here. Um, I think, <laughs> It's a big question. The reality is, is this has been an ongoing, uh, it's not even a phenomenon, an ongoing challenge with the Canadian government. Since colonization, the government has, and, and I also, okay, I'm gonna start, that's a, it's a really big question. So I'm trying to figure out what is the, the best starting place, because it is absolutely true. Indigenous peoples are being largely treated as stakeholders in many of the negotiations and discussions, uh, particularly around policy development, unless you get into a place like being an MP, like Leah, which congratulations, we need all of the people interrupting and being in those spaces and bringing forward the voice of indigenous peoples. But the reality is, is, that, is the only, that is the only place in which indigenous peoples are recognized and our voices are, are being brought up. Because despite the fact that we have treaties, which are, if you look at the definition of treaties, these are supposed to be nation to nation. So state and state coming to an, an agreement on how the lands and territories would be utilized. In the framework of Canada and the colony that is now known as Canada, is that the, much of Canada is actually still untreated. So there is huge vast tracts of land in British Columbia, the Yukon, the Northwest Territories, Quebec, and the Maritimes that remain untreated. So we get kind of caught up in this idea, we're all treaty people, but the reality is why this is important to understand these vast tracts is that one of the very first treaties of the colonial state of Canada is the Royal Proclamation of 1763 that said no land would be taken up without an agreement for it. And these agreements were treaties, state, nation to nation, state to state agreements. But there's been this devolution of what that actually means within the context to how Canada upholds and respects the governance, the leadership, um, and the needs of Indigenous communities. We have seen time and time again that once these treaties were signed, that there were these counter agreements and policies that were being created without any of our participation for how land would be governed, how agricultural lands would be developed, how you know, resources would be shared, completely excluding us from that. Further to that, they actually defined us under different acts, the Indian Act, INAC, which became the first act that kind of just nullified these agreements that they said that they were making within the context of Canada. And there have been lots of challenges to the Indian Act and we're still within that process. But what has happened is that Canada says, well, we are, you are our wards and we're taking care of you, despite the fact that we have signed all of these treaties. And to those areas where there are no treaties, that is very important because it's in violation of the very first treaty of 1763 that said no land would be taken up, where those nations actually have, and through judicial processes and the court systems have fought and won many cases in the Northwest Territories, the Yukon and British Columbia and Quebec that state that these nations actually have rights that supersede some of the, you know, the policies that have been created for land management, ecosystems management, uh, biodiversity management, species management, and, and, and just on and on and on we go. There's some really, really good ones like the Chilcotin case in BC, which defines that Indigenous peoples can define their traditional territory and have the right to say what happens within it. And so what's happened when it comes down to climate policy is that the government's just kind of like, okay, we can't deal with all of these different nations that we signed treaty with because it's impossible because there are 634 indigenous nations. Each nation comes, it falls under a chief and those chiefs are signatories to different elements of treaties 
or de facto treaties as they call them in the untreated territories and zones. And uh, the government is just like, we can't, we, we can't have a relationship with every single one of these nations. And then further to that, there are over 50 Inuit settlements and there are growing and countless Métis settlements uh, and nations being developed across so-called Canada. And so this creates this tremendous responsibility on the government to recognize these nation to nation agreements. Does that mean that they don't have to do it? No. The reality is, is that the treaty agreements and the very foundations of this country state that they must respect indigenous communities. Further to that, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples further entrenched into international law that indigenous communities and peoples peoples, not necessarily a community de as defined by the colonial system, but Indigenous peoples as defined by ourselves, have the rights to our own representation, to be able to, um, to, to ensure that our free prior and informed consent is obtained. However, we've seen particularly within climate policy, which has far reaching impacts on our community, that that has not happened. Instead, there is this work to work with the uh, national indigenous organizations, the AFN, the Assembly of First Nations, the MNC, Métis National Council, and the I ITK, and I always screw up how to say it properly, so I'm not going to try to say it because I feel like I will be disrespectful to I ITK. I'm gonna try really hard next time, I swear, I promise that I will get it right. Um, and, and so these councils have been working with the federal government but it doesn't actually absolve them of having to do their duty to consult and to work with the indigenous communities at large, especially if they want to, especially if communities are like, hey, we wanna work directly with you because we have some solid ideas. We have some solid strategies. There are cer certain things that are being missed through these national bodies. The government has a duty to, to consult and work with those nations, but they're hiding behind this veil of these national indigenous people's organizations. And I'm not trying to crap all over these organizations. They are advocates for our communities. They are doing the best with that they can with their resources, but they, can, they also cannot do their due diligence to speak to every single community. And that's why it's important that when our communities stand up and ask for space and ask to be included in policy development, solutions development, that we be included in those processes and that we're not just defaulting to national indigenous people's organizations. All of our communities have the right to be heard and it's critical because those communities are the ones on the ground. Those are the communities that have that deep relationship with the lands, the ecosystems, the waterways, the species that we critically need to be protecting in order to maintain and protect the biodiversity of this planet. Because as the climate, as climate change continues to ramp up and is exacerbated by extractivism and fossil fuel production, continued fossil fuel production, particularly in Canada, that we, that we need these ecosystems. But we cannot also be relegated just to communities saving the land because our communities are also coming up with ingenious ideas of how to have localized energy, localized economies, localized food security. And all of this draws from critical indigenous knowledge systems that are being left out of current policy development. And this, this is, goes to like grid reform, <laughs> like food security issues, economics and trade, the whole gamut can be included if we tap into and we draw on the indigenous community's knowledge. But two things need to happen. Governments need to be willing to listen and indigenous communities need to understand the power that our knowledge has in driving solutions and that we have the right to because both of those things are being uh, minimized, invisibilized and sort of pushed to the side table by saying we're working with national organizations. We need to do better. Canada needs to do better and we need to start shifting the line faster. And that's only gonna happen if our solutions are also included in the suite of solutions on climate change. Brilliant, thank you so much, Ariel. That was amazing. Uh, you set the bar pretty high there. So we can clearly ask some even bigger questions of Leah. Uh, here we go, Ian. Wow, it was great to hear you put voice to it. I mean, we've been reading this all week, you know, reading 
reading the the uh, the the policy the policy piece. Sorry, I spilled coffee on mine. But anyways, I, I still respect you, Ian. I just want to <laughs> let you know that. <laughs> I <laughs> uh, love, love the grace in this circle. It's so, it's so good. Uh, yeah, so really great to hear, hear you voice it. Uh, it, it. It brings a whole new spirit to, to, to the work that you've been doing. So thank you. Um, thank you, Ariel. So Leah. So in this Indigenous Climate Action Report, we read that Indigenous leaders haven't been given a meaningful voice in the climate policy discussion. So how do you experience this from where you're sitting? Uh, you, you have a seat in the halls of power in Ottawa. As an MP, do you have the space to speak your truth as a woman and as an Indigenous woman? I think of Mumilat Kakak, uh, who was profiled and alienated in the halls of power and had to resign. I think of Jody Wilson-Raybould, who, who was Canada's Attorney General and Minister of Justice, and even with her position of power, couldn't speak her truth and remain in government. So have you been given the space you need to speak your truth? And if not, what needs to change? So thank you so much for that question. Um, I'm very excited to be joining you from home, uh, Treaty One Territory, um, homeland of the Anishinaabe, Dene, Cree, Oji Cree, and uh, traditional um, homelands of the Métis Nation. It's just really nice uh, to be here um, with you all today. And I just want to start out by commending everybody in this circle for taking time to learn. And I know working with Steve for many years on human rights matters, I, I, I don't know you as well, Ian, but I feel like if you keep good company like Steve, um, that uh, I know that you've had very thoughtful discussions and probably some really difficult discussions reflecting on place and space and even participation and benefit from um, the genocide of Indigenous peoples upon which this place we now call Canada um, has been established ongoing. So I always get a bit off put by that question. And I'll tell you why. Because as a human being, I have accomplished more in my life than being Indigenous. That particularly as an Indigenous woman, um, I am born into my power as an Indigenous woman. And so I always, I'm not saying that the, certainly the realities we know murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. We know, even when we're talking about extractive industries, we know that Indigenous women and girls experience heightened rates of violence around resource extract. We know this. Uh, I live in the city that was called Ground Zero for MMIWG2S. Those realities are, are real. Uh, the violence is real. The targeting is real and the stigma is, is real. Um, but I also sit in my power and I have a voice and I choose how I wish to use or not use my voice. We all have that choice, not just Indigenous people in those halls of power. We all have a choice to either take courageous stands or not. Um, you know, uh, I had uh, the privilege of working with Mumilat Kakak. Uh, I also had the privilege of working with uh, Jody Rabel Wilson, two tremendous uh, leaders that I have so much respect for. And I don't think it's any secret. And certainly when I decided to run, like there is no more violent, colonial, misogynistic, uh, paternalistic environment than the House of Commons. Like every day I go into work and my human rights are literally up for debate, mostly focused around resource extraction and the inconvenient Indian. Uh, I go to work in a place where we had a national inquiry into murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. Uh, now, like two years later, zero dollars attached. Where's the action? No national action plan. You know, um, we have a housing crisis. Uh, you know, and we talk about this new thing called economic 
reconciliation, which I find very rich uh, because it's not provided with choices. So if we want to talk about economic reconciliation, why don't we talk about economic reconciliation? Why don't we talk about not starving out communities so that they really have true choice? So, you know, when I go in there, I feel very privileged. I'm one of 338, it'll now be more, they're rejigging ridings, people in, in this place we now call Canada that gets to fight for human rights, that gets to be a, a voice in that place. And it's not an easy place, but it's a privilege. And so when I'm sitting there, I don't think I have it so rough when I look at the grand scheme of it all. Like I have a roof, I have food I get to eat, you know, um, I'm in there fighting for my community, the third poorest riding in the country. Like you want to talk about rough, you know, being unsheltered is rough. That's the hardest job in the world. Poverty is the most violent human rights violation. That's a hard job. Um, but you do have to maintain balance in there. There's no doubt about it. You know, I, I haven't been working out lately. I injured my arm. I'm turning 50 and I'm like, okay, everything's imploding a month before my birthday. But anyway. Like, it's like, but, you know, I work out, um, I stay focused on work in Ottawa. I don't do a lot of the Schwindigs. In fact, I do none of them pretty much, unless it's like something that I need to do. Uh, I make a point of not doing it. Um, I try and center myself in my values. And I knew what I was getting into uh, when I decided to run. My partner uh, was a member of parliament, decided not to run after eight years of service um, and, uh, I just take that time. Um, and, you know, when, after the, the whole, like, you know, Jody's book, great book, you know, uh, Mumilak, uh, resigned, um, you know, every interview question I had was, what is it like being an Indigenous politician? They didn't ask about what's going on with your housing crisis. We have a climate crisis. What are your thoughts about that? Um, as an Indigenous woman, if I'm not in that place, who's taken that seat? And my perspective and my per opinion uh, on behalf of constituents in my riding that have trusted me enough with their good faith to represent them, that this space is all taken up by my identity, uh, which informs my values absolutely, um, you know, I think feeds into that white colonial environment of othering uh, that says, instead of saying, how are you going to fight for your place in there? Or how do you force your voice in there? Um, that, that we kind of never get to that discussion. And saying that, you know, um, when I was elected, I, I had four bottom lines. And these are, and I've kept two of them. And it's, sometimes it's lonely. It's a lonely schlog, as my brother Steve has heard. Like, it's a lonely schlog. So my, these are my four bottom lines. Am I respecting human rights? Am I ex respecting Indigenous rights? Am I supporting something that will allow us to meet climate targets and, you know, ensure a protection of Mother Earth? And are you asking me to break the rule of law? And I have stayed true to that. And when I say uphold the rule of law, I don't want to take too much time. That's a really critical piece, which is why I've taken a very a different stand sometimes. Uh, you know, and my party has been very supportive. I, I want to put that out there. For example, I've been very vocal about um, the violent, aggressive RCMP action on Wesoatin, unceded Wesoatin territory. Um, you know, I, I've brought up these kind of massive human rights uh, infractions that, that are occurring now in Canada, because if I don't do that, then I'm not upholding the rule of law, and that is to uphold our constitution, and that also includes Aboriginal rights and title, and since 2007, the application of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in Canadian law. And so doing that, 
I feel like I'm doing my job and I'm also doing my constituency and the people in my riding are a real respect because I do, and I'm maybe a bias, but we, I come from like the most progressive uh, riding with people who care about human rights, people who care about climate justice, people who care about reconciliation. So for me to do otherwise would be a disrespect to the people who voted for me. Um, politics is not easy for anybody. I think it's more difficult, certainly for people who were never supposed to have a seat in there. I am not going to be silenced by colonial violence. I'm going to keep speaking up and um, I, I feel okay with it, you know, and then I go out and I like work out and I smash weights around and sometimes I eat good food and listen to music and then watch Netflix every once in a while when I have a moment. And uh, what a privilege. I feel so honored. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Leah. And just appreciate the, the honesty and uh, the power in which you speak and also for your redirection of that question. Uh, appreciate um, how you went about that. This next question is actually for both of you. So feel free, either of you, to weigh in. And it comes from a member of our group, Jeff Thiessen. And it concerns the root causes of the climate crisis. Jeff says, uh, I was struck by the section in the ICA report where it names endless capitalist growth and its continual violation of Indigenous rights as the root of climate disruption. This strikes me as deeply true, says Jeff, yet it causes me deep despair since I don't see anyone in leadership naming and addressing this entrenched paradigm in a serious way. Of course, grassroots Indigenous leaders and land defenders and, and people of conscience on the ground are seriously challenging growth paradigms and extractive economics, says Jeff. But the political powers and the parties in general aren't. Why is that? And how do we make this conversation mainstream and do it soon, given the short time that we have to prevent eco collapse. So big questions, right? But critical. Um, I, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna start. I have a book on my shelf. So um, first off, let's let's not let's not sugarcoat the the fact that Canada. Like I actually just shared. I think it was today on my Instagram thread uh, a little meme that popped up, and I'm just gonna read it to you. Um, it says, once you realize Canada isn't a country so much as it is a 400 year old, 400 plus year old resource extraction company with slick branding, it makes a lot more sense. So Canada itself has deep roots in extractive resources and redistribution of those resources, largely to white colonies, other white colonies. I was a part of an incredible project called Extraction Empire, and it's the entire history of Canada's role in extractivism not just, and it starts with the Hudson Bay Company, which is the largest land transfer um, and sale and purchase of land in the entire world, uh, an illegal land transfer, because the king, a king of France just like decreed that this large tract of land was his, and then he gifted it to someone like his nephew, I don't know, I don't know enough about colonial French history, but all I know is that it ended in some like rich French man's hands to create the Hudson Bay Company, and then he sold it to the, colo the colony that became so-called Canada. And this book sort of goes through not just Canada itself, but Canada's deep roots in extractivism across the planet. Canada owns more extractive projects in the world than any other country. And they've made the rule book by, their, by de devising and really stratic strategically defining and clarifying just how close they can get to breaking those rules that Leah just outlined. Human rights, indigenous rights, taking care of mother earth. They have learned how to get away at the very edge of how far they can push that line. And they perfected it to the point that apartheid was modeled after Canada's Indian Act. There is all of this stuff that we have to reconcile with. So of course, Canada, so-called Canada does not want to admit that because it wouldn't just affect how they operate here in their own country. It would require them to look at it on a larger scale. And then we'd have to look at it, how this is duplicated everywhere. Even the colonization of other 
uh, Commonwealth countries, particularly looking at Australia, New Zealand, um, and Canada, they all have very similar processes for how they push that line and how a lot of their colonizing of those countries, those three key countries, is rooted deeply in extractivisms to perpetuate infinite growth within this colonial capitalist model. And in order to admit that, they would have to also be willing to shift that. And that is the biggest challenge. I think for myself, I see this, there's a big problem that, that we see because, you know, particularly the decolonizing climate policy uh, report, decolonization has become like this buzzword. It's like, we're gonna decolonize, we're gonna begin this decolonizing process here and there and everywhere. But we have to understand what it truly means. And when you start to move through the word itself and breaking down the sentiment, you can start to see the difference between what we are actually doing, which is indigenizing versus decolonizing. Leah, I feel like is straddling a line. She's, she's indigenizing parliament by showing up and be the face, but she is also doing some really cool work on pushing the envelope to work towards decolonization. And there's a clear difference and I wanna define them. Indigenizing is about inclusion. It's like diversity inclusion. We can see their voices, they're heard. We, we flower reports with indigenous peoples, indigenous rights, but there's no substantive change to systems of power. Indigenizing works to make indigenous peoples values and knowledge sit like visible within colonial systems, but it maintains centering colonial system structures and power rather than relinquishing. Decolonizing, on the other hand, is an undoing and a decentering of colonial lenses, processes, systems, and power. And it requires these colonial institutions to relinquish power, resources, and processes as opposed to absorbing decolonial knowledge systems, power, and processes. And if we only, only indigenize, it diminishes our sovereignty as opposed to bringing it forward. And so some of the stuff that Leah talks about what she's doing is she's, she's showing up and she's not just being an indigenous woman to be visible. She's like, I'm focused on poverty. I'm focusing on these core issues that we need to systemically change and get our people back in power and not just be another indigenous brown face in parliament so they can check off that they have indigenized their spaces. And when it comes down to these root causes, we have to move from just visibility to really starting to deconstruct these systems. Capitalism and greed has deep roots in systems of white supremacy. And white supremacy is predicated on systems of hyper-individuality, notoriety, and wealth. And when we can start to see that those are the structures that are holding up these colonial systems, you can see why they don't want to name them because they would have to begin that process of actual decolonization, which would require them to relinquish power. Um, thank you for, th for that, Ariel. I'm feeling pumped up and ready to go back to Ottawa. <laughs> I really appreciate it and appreciate everybody here. I, um, like, I think it's important to honor the fact that the whole place we now call Canada was built on the violent dispossession and genocide of Indigenous people and ongoing violence. Um, I think now, you know, I think Ariel did a fine job talking about uh, history and what I've been calling for in the House of Commons is it's, it's, you know, even with the current vaccine and the illegal occupation in Ottawa that was vile and violent, I said, I don't think it's about pro-mandates and anti-mandates. It's about the ultra-wealthy and everyone else. Um, and the privileging of corporate privilege over human rights. We have numerous examples in real time. One of the most vile examples uh, that I repeat uh, to uh, no nauseam in the House of Commons, Commons particularly when during the illegal occupation, was the fact that Nothing happened there. There was like bouncy castles. There was 
you know, stages. I had to walk through it to get to work. I said, I'm not letting them stop me from going to work. That is defeat. Um, you know, pig roasts, uh, you know, concerts. Not, no response yet on Wesotan territory, unseated Wesotan territory, two RCMP officers with a chainsaw and an ax and a guard dog violently took down a door of two unarmed women living their existence, living their rights on their own land. That to me is symbolic of the ongoing violence and genocide that is rooted in a growing corporate dictatorship, not just in Canada, but globally, um, that privileges uh, the rights, or not the rights, sorry, the privileges of corporation above the, the human rights of individuals, including the human rights articulated in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. A discussion around fossil fuel industries that, you know, in the midst of what we're seeing in Ukraine, uh, you know, NATO leaders coming together and what is the topic of the day? Uh, Putin and the petro state. If we wanna deal with autocrats like Putin, then we need to, as Ariel uh, has mentioned, we need to immediately divest from fossil fuels in, in an aggressive way. We need to uh, invest in clean technologies. If we want to um, protect peace in the world, uh, including peace for Mother Earth, so that Mother Earth, ne never mind our ability to thrive and survive, but that Mother Earth can thrive and survive. So that, you know, when we see like towns burning up, like Lytton, BC, you know, as it was horrifying watching people lose everything. But then I was sitting in, you know, it was late at night and I thought about the four leggeds and how much grief they were experiencing losing their herds and losing their relatives. And I think, you know, I, Indigenous climate action action does tremendous work and I think central to that work is really um, creating an understanding that we are all interrelated and everything is interrelated and interconnected you can't have one thing um, without the other um, so how do you convince governments uh, to change at uh, that I think you know it's a slog and I think there is a battle, but I, I don't think I'm actually that powerful. I think that's, I think that's a misconception. I think I'm very irrelevant. In fact, I think the movement is powerful and the movement, what it does is it empowers my voice in that house to decolonize that violent colonial place that has way too much dude space. Let's get real here. I mean, we need to decolonize, but we also have to de-dude a little bit. We know we need more diverse gender and women in politics. I'm just saying, I'm like, there's a whole lot. I, if, I, if I get so much mansplaining, I barely know how to get out of my house, uh, make a decision for myself anymore. I've lost that skill. I, like, it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty dude heavy. Um, but it, it gives me a voice to push to the point where, um, you know, uh, like now I'm front page news for a lot of it, like really right wing, you know, oil lobby groups. Uh, that's OK. I'll take it. Uh, is it stressful? Well, if if they if they agreed with me, I'd worry about my where my values were headed. And I just think that um, we need to call on elected officials to um, uphold human rights uphold Indigenous rights, ensure that we are meeting climate targets and honoring Mother Earth and upholding the rule of law. Because we're as powerful as one vote. We're pretty irrelevant. And I'd never lose sight of that. So um, we, I think we need to shift our focus to ourselves and our power and how we can, we all are pushing for the change in different places. 
uh, you know, Ian, Steve, you're here today pushing for change. Everybody in the circle learning is pushing for change. I'm pushing for change in that place. Uh, Ariel has been, is pushing uh, for change in the movement uh, on the ground. So I think we need to shift that focus. Awesome. Thanks so much, Leah. Um, that's going to tie in nicely to a question that we got we have for later uh, talking about movement building potentially. So, but first, uh, another question from Ian. Oh, yeah, uh, Ariel. So part of the ICA's role is to connect with and, and support indigenous communities across the, uh, these lands and learning from them what climate justice looks like. So, in the prior question, we talked a bit about the root causes of climate injustice, you know, the capitalism, extractivism, failure to honor indigenous uh, sovereignty. But what about the uh, root causes of indigenous climate justice? So what lies at the root of indigenous climate action? What gives, what gives you all this, uh, all this energy and power and strength uh, and 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 depth of purpose. That's a good question. I think some of the challenges when we talk about climate change and climate solutions is that a lot of the solutions that are being proposed um, really rely on degrading the climate crisis uh, to a mathematical equation that needs to be solved. It's like, how much greenhouse gas emissions do we need to decrease? And how much more carbon storing trees do we need to plant? And that's, that's the end. And then we'll fix the climate crisis and we'll all get to pat ourselves on the back and move on. It doesn't address a lot of what, what, um, what Leah had just talked about. It doesn't address the systemic violence that's being held. It doesn't address the fact that the, this war in Ukraine and Russia is being used as fodder to push for more pipelines and increased oil production in Canada, which is creating sacrifice zones. And you know where those sacrifice zones are. They're in indigenous communities. Environmental racism, climate injustice lives on the backs of indigenous, black, brown, and people of color, communities in poverty. They prey on those because they know that we are so locked in crisis of trying to address those basic human rights that Leah fights for in the house for our for, for housing for addressing poverty basic income you keep communities in crisis and you can put a power plant right next to them you can put a giant tar sands extraction project especially and then you say don't worry we can give you jobs and so when you are able to degrade the climate crisis just to this mathematical equation that has now resulted in carbon trading schemes where people are selling carbon credits, where Shell can now buy credits from the Amazon so that they can continue their operations in the tar sands while they save a few trees down there. It is a completely uh, broken system that is built on capitalism and systems of continued extractivism and continued uh, infinite growth within these capitalist systems. So we can't, we can't risk just doing that because otherwise we're going to continue to replicate the systems of harm and oppression that have contributed to the climate crisis already. The reason we, we even see some of these extractive projects is because our communities have been coerced, intimidated, um, and manipulated into accepting them as that's just what, how, it, how it is. We're talking mega hydro, deforestation, oil and gas, sweet gas, minerals, diamonds, all these resources, we've been told they're good for us. And so when we talk about what is climate justice, we can't just get locked up in like, we talk about free prior informed consent a lot. A lot of people within the climate justice movement, even within like the framework of what does indigenous rights mean? We need to have the right to say no. We talk about this a lot, but what we're missing in the context of free prior and informed consent is that it's not just about getting locked in on what consent is. It's about understanding that there must be free of intimidation, coercion, and manipulation. That there must be in, like information that is shared, all available information in languages that is accessible, and there must be time in order for those communities to process that information and to develop their own analysis so that they can come to a conclusion of whether or not they give consent or not. 
What we have done is we brush the processes and we ask indigenous communities in the 11th hour, do you want this? And they don't know. And they say, okay, listen, we'll give you some money for it. We'll give you some jobs because we realize you're locked in poverty. You're locked in these systems. So justice is about removing those barriers. Justice is about making sure our communities aren't in poverty. Justice is about ensuring that our communities have access to education, clean water. It's about ensuring that we have the best available information, that information on climate policies and the climate emergency is coming to our communities so that we know how to build those solutions so that we can build our own climate emergency plans that can be replicated and developed at large, that draws on that deep, intimate knowledge that we have from being in the places that we have lived for thousands and thousands of years. And we have to understand that Canada itself is only a country that's less than 160 years old. But the knowledge from our communities, that tacit knowledge, that intimate relationship with the species, with the waterways, with the medicines, with everything in those living spaces is drawn on thousands and thousands of years of knowledge that's wrapped up in biology, conservationism, economies, <laughs> trade, all of it, housing, education, it all comes and is bred by this land. And when we talk about justice, it's not just about inclusion again. It's about looking at those knowledge systems that our communities have built over millennia to be included at the same level as science the same level of Western colonial systems, and that they are also indicators of what solutions look like, what, what it looks like to build you know, fair economic systems, what it looks like to build fair housing, what it looks like to build fair education. It can't just be derived and der like derived from those narrow boxes of a colonial framework. We have to be willing to expand. And so that, Justice peace is about us having autonomy, self-determination, the barriers removed from hundreds of years of colonization that have robbed us of our ability to access those spaces and resources. And really most importantly is a redistribution of power and resources so our communities can start to build up again. And we cannot allow solutions of like urgency and crisis to drive that thing that just pushes us off to the side. Oh, the crisis is so, it's so important. We have to address it immediately. We don't have time to resolve hundreds of years of colonization. If we don't, we are at risk of replicating the very same systems that have robbed our people in the first place. So justice is really about more than power. It's about more than, than being in the halls of parliament, but it's also about reconnecting reconnecting with our cultures, our languages, our lands, our territories, and about sharing that knowledge with settlers and allies to broaden the scope of what climate justice could really look like. Thanks so much for that, Ariel. As you, as you were sharing, I um, kept on having TRC call to action number 60 come to my mind, and that's the call for churches to respect Indigenous spiritualities in their own right. And I was just thinking that it, it's across the board, respecting Indigenous knowledges and, see, and you know, recognizing that these are millennia old knowledges in this space and, and uh, the power that they hold. Um, Talking about urgency and how that might frame uh, what people imagine as political solutions in this context, that touches on how we think about the state and what the state might do in um, emergency mode. So this next question, Leah, is reflecting on, um, so I know you know Seth Klein and we've all read this book, A Good War. And in A Good War, Klein's blueprint for change has a central role for the state, just as it did in World War II. The state, it's its like a big vision for the state. The state's gonna overhaul the economy, create new crown corporations, pass a lot of laws and mandates and more, all in order to implement game-changing climate policy in just a matter of years. So we're wondering, how do you feel about this big vision for the state? And if so, and if you if you affirm it, how do we most effectively bring that about? Like, and this goes back to the movement question, because a lot of us, 
like we're people who are filling out, you know, um, email petitions and letter campaigns, but there's a sense of like, um, to match the moment we're in, this isn't big enough. So what do we do about that? Okay. Well, I mean, I think there's, I mean, that's a huge question in terms of how to push the state. I think to start out, I think we all know that you know, over time, uh, we see governments actually selling off crown corporations, you know, going back to like this growing corporate dictatorship, the fact that Bezos took a rocket ship to the moon. Um, like, I think, you know, part of, um, you know, uh, changing systems is naming the system, like this rigged uh, capitalistic system uh, that has resulted in the ultra wealthy and everyone else. I mean, that's that's the fact, everything else. Um, and the fact that these structures are actively supported by the state and the current government. If you look at the amount of ongoing funding to fossil fuel industries, if you look at the corporate bailouts that happened during the pandemic, meanwhile, People are rolling on the streets, experiencing being unsheltered for the first time more than ever in history. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the midst of a pandemic where mental health is all at an all time low, um, cutting back on programs that are sustaining people's ability to live. And most recently, uh, cutting all, health, all mandates, health mandates, Responding to the economy, when we know in Europe, we see rates of the pandemic and COVID-19 going through the roof again. Like we could learn by example, we choose to turn a blind eye uh, in, in, in the favor of, of the of so-called economy. And I mean, this is, this is where it's at. So that's what you deal with every day um, in, the, in the House of, House of Commons. So I think, you know, and we were discussing this uh, before the panel, I think the way forward is to find a way to connect the movements on the outside with the movement on the inside. And I think more than ever, we need a movement. I think, you know, um, putting all the faith and, and centering power around elected officials. And we do, we are legislators. I'm not saying that we're not important. We are not playing a role, but if you center, I don't think the power is actually with us. I think it's with the movement that empowers, uh, you know, legislators that are currently in the house to vote people in that will make those changes and to also call out people when they are not to put the political pressure on. That's, I mean, Steve, we, we uh, walked, we, published we you know i you know i know that uh, the former crown indigenous uh, relations minister caroline bennett couldn't go to church anymore uh you know when we were uh, lobbying for bill uh, uh, c262 that didn't pass because of five unelected unaccountable senators but that it forced the government to pass bill c15 uh, to see the full adoption and implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And here's the thing, I don't think colonial behavior is going to shift anytime soon, but at least we have a legislative tool on, upon which to hold the government to account. The bill that I proposed in the last um, parliament was the first test of the government uh, to create legislation that was consistent with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, voted in block against by the Conservatives and the Liberals. So we have to say that's not okay. Guaranteed livable basic income, one of the reasons I'm proposing this bill is very clear. One, it's a direct call to call 4.5, call to justice, call for justice 4.5 of the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls. Um, to, to, to immediately implement a guaranteed livable basic income. But if we want to move to a, a, a green, like a clean uh, energy world, we have to give people resources so that they can make that move. You know, like this, this you know, I think Ariel uh, spoke about this so well when she talked about, spoke about, you know, they starve people out and then they say, well, this is, Okay, you want to make a choice, but it's, it's, I call that not a true choice. That's a false choice. 
And it's a, a choice that has been overpowered by this growing corporate dictatorship uh, that has more privileges than human rights as we are witnessing in Wet'suwet'en Territory, uh, Ferry Creek, um, you know, all, all across the country. Um, and I think it's a, incumbent upon all of us to do our job for human rights. That includes the right to a clean, healthy, and safe environment from wherever we're sitting within the conversation. I know that this is a faith group, and I have to say that the faith community is a powerful force. There is nothing more scary than white voting Christians in this country. You are a force, force, and you need to use that and use your organization and your collateral to say no more, no more fossil fuel subsidies, no more corporate bailouts. We expect every dollar to be invested in people and our mother earth. And if you don't do that, we're going to vote you out. So I think you, I think that's the key. I don't think it's about convincing. I think it's about centering our own power uh, in this in this movement and pushing it out and working collectively and and focusing on what we can do and pushing like heck to make sure that we get it done. I'm going to keep doing that in the House of Commons. Like I said, it's a real privilege, um, but I'm only as powerful as the movement. Otherwise, I'm just another crazy person in the House of Commons, right? So I'll, I'll leave it there. And just, I know we're coming to an end. And I just want to thank everybody. Always great to see you, uh, Ariel. Such a pleasure to uh, meet you, uh, Ian, uh, in this kind of form. And of course, always my brother, Steve. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. I just want to say back to Leah, like, I, I know that you're just like, I'm not that powerful, but like, it's important that you're there because once you build that collective movement you talked about, then we've got Aaliyah to be like, okay, help us move this bill, help us move this motion forward. And that's where that critical role and that's where your power really lies. And I think like those are critical pieces. And I don't want you to diminish your power because it is, you're, you're critical to the solutions. But I think what Leah is challenging all of us in this space is that she can only do this work if we get up and we're loud, she can only speak and be able to point to the people that are asking for it. And if the people aren't asking for it, then it makes her job exponentially harder inside. And so I just wanna like honor what your role and what you do. I just, I just don't like you saying, I'm not that powerful because I'm just like you are. So I just wanna recognize that. And also say thank you. It's been so lovely to hear your voice and see everyone here too. You're muted, Ian, if you're speaking. I'm unmuted. Ah, Leah, Ariel, thank you very much. Thanks for that final nudge too, Ariel, to say we got to stand up and thanks. And you nudged us too, Leah, by saying centering in our power. And and uh, and I think we've been witness to 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 your strength as well. I have felt I, I have felt moved, and I uh, I I. I pray that uh, it's time to, to, to live that out personally and for this circle. So on behalf of everyone here, thank you. Thank you very much. I know you have family, you have other work to get to and uh, love it that you were here uh, and, and terrifically honored. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Be safe, kind, and just let's love each other. Yes. Take care, Masi everybody. Cho. Masi thank, cho. You. thank you. Take care, everybody. See you, friends. <laughs>